All right, I think that worked. I see some folks in the chat. Um, if you can hear me, please write a note in the chat that you can hear me because I can't really tell. Maybe it's working. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate everyone coming out to join. Um, where are we? Yeah, so for those who don't know me, thank you, William. For those who don't know me, uh, this is my name and title. Title. Uh, I run two companies that make microphones. Uh, one is called Roswell Pro Audio and one is called uh, Microphone Parts or Mic Parts for short. And uh, Mic Parts is primarily for people who like to build their own microphones. Um, and then Roswell Pro Audio is primarily for people who just want to buy microphones. So, um, what I wanted to do today is talk about some basic Q and A because I get a lot of questions via email that I answer as best I can via email, but I think a lot of those answers are probably shared. Sorry, a lot of those questions are probably shared by a lot of other folks as well. And um, it makes more sense to try to share the answers, um, which I think would be good for a lot of folks, hopefully helpful for a lot of folks. Um, and so I did get some questions via email in advance of this, and I'll be looking through the chat in just a moment to get to those as well. Uh, so I'm gonna open with, um, and by the way, use the chat. Um, thank you, Chris. Use the chat if you uh, need anything, if something happens, goes sideways. This all feels a little fragile to me. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Okay, first question, most frequently asked microphone question uh, that I ever get. Uh, and also my least favorite, but worth talking about because it's a really important one and really common one as well. Uh, and that question is this, and I get this all the time, and even when it comes in via email, it is somehow written in crayon. What is your best mic? And uh, this is a tough question because on the one hand, it sort of presupposes that out of all the mics I make, you know, 15 different models, that 14 of them suck and one, this is a, is good, and that's a secret. <laughs> so the premise kind of doesn't make sense, but the bigger issue is that the answer is it depends. It depends what you want. They're all different. Uh, they all do different things. They excel at different things. And so uh, even when that question is qualified, like what is your best vocal mic, or what is your best male vocal mic, or even what is your best vocal mic for rap, even when you drill that down, the answer is it depends. So here's a way to think about that. If you go to a painter and you say, what's the best color, right? There isn't really an answer to that question. Uh, you know, you're trying to paint uh, the sky or you're trying to paint a cow. Different colors work for different things. And that's really analogous, I think, to microphones as well. Uh, yeah, Carlton Lawson says, two word answer for what exactly? What What's the best microphone for what? But it's really very personal, very subjective. So here's another variation of that question that is actually uh, asked in a better way. So this one actually came in uh, yesterday. And that was, here's what I own. What should I buy to complement this? Okay, so this is actually a much better question to ask. And there's a couple of reasons for that that I'll get into. But, um, you know, basically, uh, every different source in your studio sounds different, right? Every singer, every uh, instrument, every guitar. I mean, guitar players don't own just one guitar. There is no one best guitar, right? They get, have different guitars because each one feels different, sounds different, inspires different kinds of things. And so microphones, similar to that, are picked to complement whatever source you're trying to um, to record, and so as a, just as an exercise. Now, you know this list that this guy sent in is not shared by probably any of you, and it doesn't matter because I'll use this as an illustration of the process that I would go through. Um, and so he's got a, a AKG 414 and a pair of AKG 214s. He's got a Neumann TLM 103. He's got a pair of MXL small diaphragms and an MXL ribbon. Okay, so basically four large diaphragm condensers, two pencil mics, and a ribbon mic. So, uh, you know, as I said, one of the things that you want is to have microphones that sound different. Um, and the reason for that is that, again, everything that you record uh, is going to need something, could potentially need something different, a uh, different sounding mic to capture it well. Uh, and that's a, a, 
an idea that I talk about called sonic diversity, right? You want to have a lot of different kinds of mics, different sounding mics in your collection, just like a painter would have different colors or different brushes. And so within this list, um, again, not shared by anyone here necessarily, but uh, you've got several large diaphragm condensers that are, uh, in my experience, in this voiced on the sort of neutral side. Okay, the 214s and the 414 are fairly neutral. The TLM 103, another transformerless mic, um, voiced with a sort of uh, rising frequency response. I think it's plus four or plus five dB at eight to 10K, uh, which can be good for clarity, can be too bright, in my opinion, for some things. Um, and then the, the two pencil mics and the, and the ribbon. Now, the ribbon's going to be much darker. Um, and, uh, and the pencil mics uh, are going to be different. You know, small diaphragm mics have typically better cardioid pattern control than large diaphragm mics. Um, those particular small diaphragm mics often have uh, a, a sort of dip in the eight or nine K range and then a, a bump above that. But I guess without getting further into the weeds about these specific mics, when I look at something like this, I think, okay, what would, what would be different sounding to all of this? And so one answer would be uh, a different a mic with a different kind of capsule in it that's, that's not going to have that uh, the same sort of flat-ish or flat but bright frequency response. Um, another idea would be a mic whose circuit is going to contribute some grit or saturation, like a tube mic or something that was designed to, to evoke some other kinds of character out of the sound. So that kind of analysis is, I think, really helpful. Uh, and, and this is the sort of thing I can help people with as well. If you have, you know, a specific list you want to send, I'm happy to take a look at that. Um, and I guess what might be helpful too, for those who have a various collection of, or a collection of various kinds of microphones and they're not sure how to classify them all. I mean, you, you know, inherently having used them, if they seem neutral or bright or dark or mid forward or, you know, whatever other qualifier, and so you you typically would just want to find something that's different so that when a singer comes into your studio and you put up the, in this case, the 414 or the 214, and it's not giving you what you want, you think, okay, why isn't it? Is it sibilant? Is it, you know, is it too bright? Is it thin? Uh, and, and if it is something like that, then, you know, buy a microphone that doesn't have that quality or that has some other quality that you can try out and uh, and see how that works. So um, another question that came in is, uh, this is a really interesting one. Should I buy a mic pre or an outboard compressor? And, uh, you know, the answer, as is always the case, is it depends. Um, in this particular case, um, I suggested to the customer that he buy a... Um, a compressor, an outboard compressor. And I'll give you, and it doesn't mean it's true for everybody, but I'll, I'll tell you why I told him that. And that is that he already had some microphones that created different sonic colors. And um, within the signal chain of microphone preamp converter, uh, the microphone is responsible for most of the sound that you're going to get. Uh, unless, unless, well, except in special cases where if your mic pre does uh, heavy amounts of, of compression or, uh, sorry, not compression, but rather uh, saturation, uh, like the Empirical Labs Mikey uh, can do this, where you can kind of add a ton of saturation to it. So unless you're overdriving the mic pre and it's set up to do that in a way that really does change the sound that you're getting out of the mic, then typically the microphone primarily determines what you're going to get, especially with a condenser mic, because the condenser mics tend to have a lot of output, a lot of level. And so the mic pre doesn't have a lot of opportunity to do anything to that sound. It's kind of just passing it through, making it a little bit louder, perhaps, but probably not dramatically revoicing it. Um, and arguably that's what it's for. Uh, it's, excuse me, to pass that sound through without completely changing it. Um, and so uh, if you need different sonic colors, buying different sounding mics is usually the best way to do that. Um, let me say that a different way. If you had just one mic and two preamps, you're going to have a lot less, you'll have fewer colors to choose from than if you had two differently voiced mics and one preamp. All right. So um, now, whereas an outboard compressor, 
Uh, in my experience, people typically use those in a different way than they apply compression later in the DAW. And so uh, it'll change the way you track and it will, it will more, I think, I think for most people will more dramatically change the kinds of sounds that you get. So again, not necessarily the right answer for everybody, but that's the way that I think about it. Um, another great question that came in, um, recording narration in, in a noisy space. Uh, and, and this particular person had two mics to pick from. Uh, one was a small diaphragm condenser with a hypercardioid capsule. Um, let's, we'll talk about hypercardioid in just a second. And the other was a stage dynamic, I think a beta, a, a sure beta 87. Um, and so I don't know if you can hear it. My cat's going crazy outside, but, uh, this is an interesting challenge. You know, voiceover narration or voiceover is a, um, a challenging, uh, recording uh, it's a challenging thing to record. And the reason is that in a lot of cases, you don't have a music bed to hide behind. So if you have a lot of noise, either in your signal chain or in your room acoustically, that noise is going to be in your track and everybody's going to hear it. So recording something quiet in a noisy space is a very difficult thing. Now, this, this particular person went on to say that he was doing um, digital noise reduction, which helped reduce the noise, but made the track sound more harsh. And then he was also doing compression, but you know the way compression works is it, it doesn't it doesn't really just turn the, the the peaks down. It actually brings everything else up. And so if you have this kind of higher level of ambient noise, then uh, that's going to get turned up with compression. That's just the way that goes. So uh, so anyway, he was asking for mic recommendations, um, and the the tough answer there, in my opinion, is you got to fix the space. Um, but let's talk about let's talk about hypercardioid for a second. Uh, so, you know, these words hypercardioid and cardioid and um, figure of eight and omni, these describe how a microphone picks up sound. I know this is a review for most people, but um, hypercardioid is really interesting uh, because it's it's deceiving. You know, cardioid means directional or unidirectional. And so you would think, you know, supercardioid is even more directional and hypercardioid still more directional. Um, but this is this is not... It's not the case that the microphone only hears what's directly in front of it. You know, I mean, a, a cardioid microphone uh, hears everything around it. Certainly it favors what's in front, but if you are off axis by 90 degrees, so what does that mean? So here's here's a cardioid microphone. Now it's pointing at me. Um, call that zero degrees. If you come over here to 90 degrees, which is directly on one side or the other, or even above, um, the attenuation is only about six decibels, uh, which is not a lot. Uh, so hypercardioid is more focused than that. And yet uh, what many people don't realize in my experience is hypercardioid has a lobe of sensitivity coming out the back. So uh, whatever, whatever the microphone is pointing at, it hears a lot from here, but it also has direct sensitivity from behind so if you're in a noisy space and there's noise over there and you've got your hypercardioid mic pointing at your mouth, the mic is also pointing back there. So you wouldn't want to point that at the window where the trucks go by or at the air conditioning unit. So, so hypercardioid can be, can be interesting, but can also be dangerous in the sense that it's going to hear other things, you know, behind the mic. Like you'd think, put the noisy thing behind the mic, that's as far away as it can get. Well, in the case of hypercardioid, not so much. Um, for if you do have a hypercardioid mic, the typically the, the area of least sensitivity is uh, roughly thirty degrees off of directly behind it. Um, so behind it, but off to one side a little bit. So uh, and then the other mic he had was the was a stage dynamic microphone. Um, I mean, you know, it, it's tough. You'd have to try them and see what works best. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, the best way to handle that situation is to treat the space. Um, and so there's there's two issues to talk about regarding treating a space. One is soundproofing and one is sound deadening. Um, so these are both kinds of acoustic treatment, uh, but they're very different and, and can be confused. So uh, the way I think about it is soundproofing is keeping sounds where you put them. So if you're making a lot of noise, like you know playing drums in a, in a room and you don't want to offend the neighbors, that's soundproofing. Um, or if you're trying to prevent truck noise from getting into your vocal mic, again, soundproofing. 
And there's a, a bunch of solutions for that. A lot have to do with mass, um, but probably not acoustic foam, which is what everyone wants to reach for uh, in a lot of cases. Now, acoustic foam is great for acoustic uh, treatment or deadening, which prevents the sounds that you're making inside the room from bouncing off the wall and coming back into the mic with a slight delay and causing echo and phase cancellation and comb filtering and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so both can be really valuable, especially if you're doing something sensitive like vocals. Um, this particular person had uh, definitely had the soundproofing problem. He mentioned truck noise, um, and uh, but treatment can be great too, can be helpful too. Um, there are portable treatment products that are worth investigating. Uh, a lot of companies make something, uh, SE calls there as a reflection filter, uh, Real Traps calls it a portable vocal booth. So there's panels that you put behind the microphone that prevent the stuff coming out of your mouth from bouncing off walls, right? It, the idea is it goes into this pad and then sort of stops. And you have to be careful because sometimes the those pads are not as absorbent as they should be. And so you do get some reflections off the front. Um, and so that's something you need to experiment with. Um, so that was a really good question. Um, let's take a look at the chat and see what's in here. So keep those questions coming. So here's an interesting one. Ted Springman says, it's been said that microphones are EQ instruments and with tubes, they're also saturation. I wouldn't disagree with that. Couldn't I get close by taking the best fed and dial in EQ and warmth with the best plug-in or hardware effects? Um, perhaps. Um, so here's, Here's something to think about. Um, a lot of microphones, especially inexpensive microphones, are voiced with a particular kind of uh, frequency response. Um, and that is that they tend to be bright. And there's a reason for that that I won't get into, but um, the, the challenge with those is because if what you ask was really true, if you could take basically any mic and then just EQ it later and, and come up with something else, then you would see a lot of software that said, use any mic you want. And then with one button click, it becomes a U47. And of course there is that software. Um, and some of the, there's more than one and some are better than others. Um, but what you'll find is that microphones that, uh, that tend to be bright by the time that signal gets digitized and put into your uh, digital media workstation, the damage has been done and it can't really be fixed. And the reason is that uh, digital filters can be uh, kind of broken by exaggerated high frequency sounds. So that can become harsh. Um, was it uh, Ross Hogarth once said to me, digital is very unforgiving of harshness. So if your microphone is harsh going in, it's kind of too late. You can't fix that. Now there are all kinds of saturation plugins where you can add second harmonics or third if you want, or, or others even. Um, and those are great fun to play with. Um, I, uh, am comforted by the idea though, that a lot of engineers, uh, tend not to work that way. Um, you know, they want the mic that gives them the sound that they want and they don't want to have to fiddle with it later. Uh, I talked to a lot of tracking engineers and they, they don't want the guy that's doing the mix, you know, cause these days that happens a lot, right? One person tracks, someone else mixes. They don't want the guy doing the, the mix to basically have to redo the whole thing. They want it basically pre-mixed and ready to go. They want the drum sounds to be great. They want the vocal sounds to be great. You know, you don't want to record a mistake and then expect that to have, you have to fix it later. I mean, what's the, the sort of ironic joke about, you know, the engineer sitting there in the, in the control room and the, the artist is out in the live room and does a vocal take and the engineer gets on the talkback mic and says, that was awful, come on in. You know, what you want is for it to be great. And um, the reason I say I'm relieved by that is because I want to make microphones. And if anyone, if everyone only needed one mic and then you just fix it later, then I'd be out of business. You know, if the world ends up going that way, fine. But uh, fortunately, it doesn't seem to. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot you can do with plugins and digital processing or even analog processing. But at the same time, what you will see if you focus on uh, guys who do this for a living and no disrespect to you, if you do, I, I don't know. But the people who are making the records that you see at the record store, uh, or on Spotify or wherever records are consumed, um, they tend to want mics that are going to give them what they want kind of on the way in. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, what is the best FET bang for the buck? Well, it, it depends. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Um, all right. So some folks are talking about the DIY kits. I can get into that more if people are interested. Um, microphone company founded by a drummer is the microphone company you want to talk to. That's by Luminous Brilliance. Thank you for that. Uh, I am a drummer, or at least I used to be before I started making mics and haven't left the workbench in 10 years. Um, what else do we have here? So um, there was a question that came in just before. Here we go. So this is similar to the other one that I had. But let's see where this takes us. Um, so collection of mics, uh, another AKG 414, a KSM44 from Shure, those are nice. Audio-Technica, SDC, Avantone CK1, which is a small diaphragm, and two Rode NT2As. And then a dead MXL 990 from a yard sale. Um, so the first question this person had, this is Davey, uh, for the Rode NT2As, which matching capsules should I buy from mic parts? So, um, so yeah, the Rode NT1 and NT2 are very popular mics. They've been making those for 15 years or something. And they've sold thousands, tens of thousands maybe. And the, the Rode NT1, I know, has gone through at least three major generations. The original NT1, the NT1A, and then the new, well, I say new, but the black NT1 from 2013 and forward. And each one... Uh, each one of those successively introduced some changes, upgrades, and so on. The, the very first generation was designed by, um, I know him, and I'm totally spacing on the name because the camera's turned on. Uh, it'll come to me. Uh, it was basically the first generation was a uh, audio upgrades. I told you, Jim Williams. Sorry, Jim. Uh, it was basically a Sheps circuit ish, you know, derived by derived from the Sheps CMC five design, which is a, a great circuit, a fantastic circuit, actually capable of incredible performance. And Jim designed it with great parts. And, um, uh, in my opinion, the capsule was bright for that design, uh, but they sold a lot of them. And then the second version came out the NT one a and a lot changed. They went to a surface mount construction. They went to a CMOS based oscillator instead of the old Sheps Hartley oscillator with inductors. Um, and that was cool because it introduced a really low noise floor. Um, I forget what they claimed if it was four or five dBA. Um, it was low. Uh, and they ran the capsule at really high voltage too, which is part of the reason that the uh, mic had such a low noise floor. Uh, and then different capsule too, edge terminated in a lot of cases, although, you know, as happens in production, you never know what you're going to get to open it up. Um, and then the new one in 2013 had a really innovative uh, shock mount on the capsule designed by Rycote, I believe. Um, and, uh, and maybe, and I don't know what else it changed. Actually, I'm not, I'm not an expert on all that. I just have taken a bunch of them apart, but, uh, some of those mic owners feel like those mics are, are bright. They tend to be voiced on the brighter side, you know, the rising frequency response. And, um, because that voicing is so popular across so many brands, especially at the low end of the price spectrum, a lot of people end up with a lot of mics that sound that way. And it's just too many, you know, having one or two of those can be fine for things that you need a brighter mic. If you want, you know, more cymbals in your drum mix, if you want, uh, the other example I use all the time is like, a a, a, a guitar with old strings, a big, a large body acoustic guitar with kind of dead strings. And it just sounds dull and boomy and muddy. And maybe a bright mic can help kind of give it a little bit more life. So I'm not saying those mics are never good for anything at all. But for those people who um, who are looking for a change, uh, my DIY company, Mike Parts, does sell capsules that can be installed into those relatively easily. You do have to solder. Um, and then uh, that totally revoices the mic. Now, earlier I said that the capsule, did I say this? I'm not sure I said this, but in a condenser mic, the capsule largely does determine the sound of the microphone. Most mic circuits are linear with respect to frequency. So whatever capsule is in the mic is kind of what you're going to hear. So, and that's definitely true of the NT1A and NT2A and the original NT1 and 2 as well. So the question was, what capsule should he buy? Well, you know, that's one of those, which is best, I don't know. But based on that particular list, um, you could go 47 or you could go 12. You know, the KSM44, as I recall, has a little bit of a mid bump. Um, wouldn't swear to it, but I've, my recollection is that it does. 
Um, the RK-47 would probably be a little bit more pronounced in that regard. Um, and then the uh, the 414 TL-2, I believe that's transformerless. That's what the TL stands for. And that has an edge terminated capsule. So that would be, you know, more similar to the 12s. Um, so uh, it's kind of a matter of what you like and what you use, um, that, you know, to see what fits in there and what makes more sense. And then he asked about a dead 990. Um, you know, the MXL 990 is a really great DIY platform. It's a great starter mic because uh, they're inexpensive. They used to be $49. They're more than that now, but you can still find them used, f you know, for under a hundred. Um, and those are a nice, a nice starter platform because uh, it's uh, like an old house in certain cases where the realtor says it has good bones. Um, you know, that mic, we have, mic parts has good upgrades for that, capsules, circuits, even grills. So um, so you can turn those mics into something really, really respectable. So, so those are pretty fun. If you like to solder, not everyone does. Much to my ongoing chagrin. Um, Chris asks, do we have a C38 or C37? The answer to that is no. Um, David... I recognize you. Hi, Matt. Do you still do the Roswell RAVO? Um, the RAVO was a voiceover mic. Uh, my pal Jordan Reynolds helped me design and voice that. And we don't have those in production, but we can make them and uh, and do periodically make them once a month or so. Someone comes in um, and asks for one of those. Um, they're really cool. Um, it's... Uh, it's basically a very high output, flat response mic. And that's the thing that surprised me about voiceover mics. You know, when Jordan asked me to make a voiceover mic, I assumed that I would want to put a transformer in there and have all kinds of saturation and, and you know, really warm it up and all whatever all these things are. And he adamantly told me that I was incorrect. He said, the character comes from my mouth, not from my microphone. Um, so Jordan, if I'm misquoting, forgive me. Um, that was my takeaway. Uh, and we ended up for sure with a very neutral mic. And the other change that we made to that was that we rolled off the low end because voiceover mics tend to be used quite close. Uh, I'm not so close on this one right now. Uh, and this is not an REVO, this is a Mini K47, but uh, because those mics tend to be used close, we rolled off the bottom end uh, to minimize the need for processing in the box after you've recorded your demo or your track, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, we can make those to order. Um, and then uh, David asks, recommendation for a single channel mic pre input chain for voiceover. So again, you know, based on what I just said about lack of color, um, my current favorite super clean high headroom mic pre, and there's, there's a bunch out there, um, but my current favorite is the RNP. So Mark McQuilkin is a pal of mine, FMR audio. Um, I have an RNP right across the room that I use frequently when I'm tracking drums. Um, that is a stereo pre, so it's not a one channel, um, but it also costs less than most, th than a lot of boutique single channel pre's would. Um, it's not, it doesn't have a bunch of channel strip features, doesn't have EQ or compression or anything like that. You can pair it with an RNP which is a really nice preamp. In fact, that is what it's called. Um, so, uh, but yeah, off the top of my head, I like that one a lot. You know, if you're looking for something colored uh, or something that's capable of color, I like the Elysia Sculptor. I like the uh, Empirical Labs Mikey. Those both come to mind. Um, UA makes some great stuff as well. Um, I have a Twinfinity that I'm just getting to know. That's a lot of fun because it's got a sort of a tube mode and it's got sort of a FET mode and you can kind of dial back and forth in between. Um, got to give a shout out to Cappy, uh, Jeff Steiger and those guys. Um, I have a pair of um, platinum 312s from Cappy. Very cool. like those a lot. But, you know, tons of choices out there as well. Um, so what else we have? Mike Heffernan asks... What is the sensitivity of the Mini K's custom high output option compared to say the Colaris? Can the STCs from mic parts be modded to have a higher output? A couple of good questions. So, um, so thanks, Mike. Uh, the, um, 
So the Mini K 47 and 87. So here's the 47. For people who haven't seen it, and, and this is the uh, Mini K 87. And we started offering um, custom shop options for these. Uh, we haven't talked about it a lot, uh, but they're available on the website. And um, one of the options, one of the circuit mod options for those two Mini Ks is a high output option. And so what's going on there is the the standard Mini K47, Mini K87, when you take it out of the box, it's kind of expected by people to be used on any number of sources. Um, I, uh, you know, not not every uh, customer, um, well, so we don't know when, when we sell the mic, what people are gonna use it for, if it's drum overheads or acoustic guitar, there's a range, a huge spectrum of uh, of sources on which someone might reasonably use a microphone. And um, I've I've talked in other contexts about how um, human human senses are much they have much more dynamic range than devices do, right? So for example, your eye can go from shadow to bright light and accommodate pretty quickly. You can see into shadows more readily than say a camera can. Uh, you know, cameras you have to set aperture and f-stop and ISO and all these different things to to make the best use of the camera's limited dynamic range. So microphones are kind of similar. Uh, you can build a microphone that can record super, super quiet stuff. Uh, but if you put that on a snare drum, it's just going to crackle and sound terrible. It's going to overload. And that is mostly because of the electronics um, that are inside the mic. They, they're expecting a certain range of voltages that they're comfortable with. And if you send in too much voltage, then, you know, things break down. Um, and so uh, the standard Mini K47 and 87 are set up to be able to be used for, for most things. I still don't recommend those for kick drum, which is just about the loudest thing anyone would record in a typical recording studio, um, except maybe trumpet. Um, uh, but you know, from from drum overheads to kind of acoustic guitars or voice, the Mini K forty seven, Mini K eighty seven work great for all those things. Uh, the uh, we sometimes see. Uh, my pal Charlie Waymeyer had some uh, attenuators built, little inline attenuators that basically just drop voltage. And he uses those when he has a very loud source, because what we found is that on a super loud source, the mic won't clip internally. The microphone's fine, but it sends so much output to your preamp that your preamp clips. So if your preamp's minimum gain setting is plus 10, which is actually kind of common, uh, and then you have a high output mic uh, and a loud source, that, that's a, that recipe delivers crunchy, broken sounds. Um, so a preamp with a true zero dB, like the RNP, uh, that I mentioned RNP. Yeah. Um, that's a solution or an inline attenuator. If you, if you, you can pick those up and um, those can be made. Um, uh, but anyway, those mics are, they cover, you know, most studio sources just fine. But what we wanted to do was kind of maximize the signal chain, the pristineness of the signal chain for people who mostly record quiet stuff. And the reason for that is that, uh, Years and years and years ago, I was uh, trying to record some quiet sources. Um, hammer dulcimer is one. It's um, uh, something that you can't mic up. I'm not an expert on micing hammer dulcimer, but it's, it seems to sound best from a couple of feet away. And I've talked to people who do a lot of acoustic guitar recording. And again, nylon string acoustic guitars often recorded from several feet away. Uh, as far as I know, I, I've never personally done it. But for those kinds of sources where it's not that loud and you're kind of far away. Uh, it's important that some other things happen to be true, which is that your room sounds good and the instrument sounds good in the room. And also that your microphone has a very low noise floor and high sensitivity so that you're getting the best possible um, amount of signal into your downstream recording device. So it's for those kinds of applications that we came out with the high output options. So we have those for both the 47 and the 87. Um, on the 47 side, the high output is a, is basically plus three to four decibels. Um, and as time has gone on, we've really honed in on the um, tolerances on these things. And so um, new production Mini K47s are pretty much within about a half dB plus or minus of each other. Then the high output option is again, you know, three to four dB higher than that. Um, and then the uh, on the 87 side, um, I'm trying to remember... I think it's uh, I think it's even higher. 
Um, I think it's plus five or six on the 87 side. Um, and so, uh, and the reason for that is that the, uh, well, the 87 capsule has higher sensitivity, so it gives us a little bit more room to move. Um, but also the 87 is really commonly picked for uh, voiceover kinds of applications where you really want that neutrality. And so we wanted to find a way that we could give that very high signal level for people who are going to be sitting in a, um, you know, in a, in, in a room doing, doing something like that. So um, someone had asked about the RAVO a bit ago, um, the high output mini K87 is probably a pretty strong contender. They don't sound the same. The 87 doesn't have that sculpted low end that we put into the RAVO, but it's also half the price. Uh, so, you know, for voice artists on a budget, that Mini K87 HO is, I think, a pretty a pretty cool option. Definitely worth considering. Um, what else do we have? Can the STCs from mic parts be modded to have a higher output? Uh, STC84, no. Um, and STC, the transformerless STC, not really. Um, you know, but no one's ever complained about those having low output either. So I'm not sure what you're going for, but Mike, if you want to hit me up with an email and tell me what's going on with that. Um, I think those are kind of running where they are. In fact, the, the build guides for those mics really kind of talk about how to pad them. Uh, you know, not always, but often small diaphragm mics are used closer to a source as a sort of spot mic. Um, if you're doing distant miking, you typically want a large diaphragm. I think, in my opinion, in most cases, you want a large diaphragm mic. And one of the reasons is that large diaphragm mics have lower noise. Um, that's just inherent in the design. You know, the the capsule itself has a noise floor. And the bigger the capsule is, the lower the noise floor is going to be. There are mics out there that have very small capsules, um, uh, you know, including like six to 10 millimeters. Um, and those, even when they're very expensive, can have noise rated in the 20 plus decibels kind of range, which is fairly high. I mean, you'll hear that. So, um, so yeah, large diaphragms are gonna always have lower noise. Um, Sorry, just reading some questions here. Appreciate the comments. Does the S47 would be close to the Gefell MT71S? I don't know. Uh, I'm not, you know, a lot of Gefell mics have that M7 capsule, which is really nice. Uh, it doesn't really sound like a K47, so I'm gonna guess no on this. The mic parts S47 is what Ilias has asked about. So the mic parts S47 was kind of the, uh, inspiration and model for, for the mic I'm using right now, the Roswell Mini K47. Um, it's a transformerless circuit, uh, K47 capsule. Most Gefell stuff has M7 capsules, which kind of just sound different. Um, yeah. Um, so and this, this segues into differences between the RK47 capsule to the M7 Tiersch. Well, one difference is that the Tiersch capsule costs a lot more. Um, and the other is that the RK that the K47 tends to have a bigger mid-range bump. Um, M7 capsules tend to be more neutrally voiced, uh, just a kind of a milder presence peak in that kind of four kilohertz range. So um, another question came in via email, which is uh, mic recommendations for piano. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, the reality is the answer is again, it, it kind of depends. We've had good success with a lot of different things and it's, um, so, so there's different things that, that can be tried. Um, uh, we, uh, sold a pair of mini K 47s, a matched pair to, um, Bill Payne from Little Feet and he loves them and they, the piano sounds great. We've got a really cool video of him doing, a uh, an improv rendition of, um, Dixie Chicken, which was one of my favorite Little Feet songs, uh, through the pair of mics just straight into whatever his interface is. It sounds great. That's up on YouTube. And um, 
But uh, what else have we done? You know, we did a uh, live stream with Gabby Gordon. I think this was in, this was, was it during NAM? Was it during AES? I don't remember. It was a month or two ago. Gabby Gordon's a female singer, songwriter, piano player, great voice, incredible voice. Um, she uh, did a live stream with us and we used a Kolaris pair on the piano because Charlie Waymeyer loves them. Um, it sounded incredible. Not everyone's got that budget. Um, so it's kind of a matter of what do you love? You know, what do you like? What can you afford? Um, I think the room matters too, you know, upright versus grand. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, if you have an upright, then use this mic. Because I think everyone's hearing is a little different too. And so what you li like is gonna change from one person to the next. And then of course the instrument does too. Um, Another question that came in is, which of your microphones is best for sibilance? Um, so, and this is, you know, unfortunately a tough question to answer because there isn't a single sibilance frequency. People, uh, male differs from female, but even then there can be a 3K range of where that might be happening. Um, what I typically recommend for performers who have sibilance issues is to get a, a very neutrally voiced microphone. Um, you know, I was doing a, uh, I was doing some testing on a mic that came in. We, we do a, a DI, uh, not a DI, we do a mod for a certain large diaphragm condenser that's pretty popular, pretty affordable. And we come up with a circuit mod for it that kind of flattens out that top end. So when we sweep these microphones, they come in the 10 K response. So at 10 kilohertz, the microphone is at plus at least three, sometimes plus five decibels as compared to the 1K response. And these things are always relative. It's, there's no absolute about a certain amount of energy at a frequency. It's all relative to everything else. So if you put that one kilohertz sound at the zero crossing line on your graph, and then you look at the 10K, the plot of this frequency up at 10K, um, if you're above about plus two, you can hear it. And what happens is that S sounds and Ps and Ts as well, they just become divorced from the sound of the track. And an interesting test is if you play it through monitors and you know play back a pre-recorded track through monitors and turn the volume down and then walk across the room. And uh, if all you hear is the S sounds, then that's uh, a sign that they're probably a little bit disconnected, right? They've been exaggerated to the point where they're almost, I mean, they're just louder than everything else. And that's the kind of sound that um, you need to be careful of. Uh, because if the mic's doing that on every voice, then imagine if someone has some, a little more energy in their delivery, meaning their, their performance has some sibilance in it. Um, it's not to say that sibilance is happening at 10K, but mics that have that sort of curve definitely exaggerate the problem. Uh, so, so, we, uh, so what I recommend is a, a neutrally voiced mic. And it's, it's amazing with these mics that we modify, you know, uh, but when they come in, they have this kind of aggressive harsh sound. And uh, we turn down that eight to 10 K response and just sort of smooth out the top end. And, um, and when people get the mics back, they, you know, they, they love the sound. It's because it's like a new mic. It's like a newer and more expensive sounding mic, but they often comment on how it sounds more balanced or the low end seems fuller. Um, and, and the reason for that is that the, in relation to the top end, the low end is fuller, right? It's not that the low end got louder, it's that the top end came down. And so that you get this kind of effect. Um, so yeah, for sibilance, uh, I would tend to go more neutral mic. Uh, the most neutral mic I make right now is the uh, Delphos 2. Um, we target those and those are all hand tuned uh, here. Actually, Mini KD7 is hand tuned here as well, but um, the, we, we voice them slightly differently and the Delphos tends to be about a DB, I don't want to say darker, but more neutral. Uh, the Mini K87 is up one DB-ish uh, in relation to the Delphos 2. So the Delphos 2 is the most neutral mic I make and it it tends to have a little bit of a dip around six or seven because that can help with vocal capture in a lot of cases as well. Um, so, uh, so that's, you know, there's no, there's no universal, uh, except that everything is relative, <laughs> uh, but that's my best answer for sibilance. Um, 
uh, Electric Owl Works. How are your K47 match pairs different from the two normal K47s? That's a good question. Um, uh, sorry about that. I didn't turn my phone off. Um, the difference is, uh, there's a couple differences. Um, the, uh, the sensitivity, as I mentioned on the, on the new production mics, the sensitivity of any two mini K47s is going to be really close because we just make sure that it is. So, um, uh, so sensitivity wise, they're going to be pretty close. Now the, the, the bigger, the bigger challenge and, you know, and some, some other companies, I won't name names, but some other companies, they'll match mics for sensitivity and call them matched. And I, I disagree with that because I think for a couple of reasons, that's the lesser of the two problems with matching mics. Uh, one reason is that many preamps are not matched. So if you have a, you know, an, an eight way mic pre, depending on how much you spent on it, the, those eight inputs may not be matched. Um, the RNP that I mentioned is, um, Mark matches them to within, um, I don't remember what he told me. I have to be a 10th of a DB. It's, it's good, good matching, good product. Um, uh, so anyway, your preamp channels might not be matched. And so if you put them up for drum overheads, put up two mics for drum overheads, what I've always done is, uh, you know, smack the snare drum a couple of times. Then you go look at your two channels and you set gain to compensate because that fixes, uh, differences between the mics, it fixes differences between the preamps. Um, so, uh, so in terms of sensitivity, the, the, any two mics will be of my mics will be pretty well matched, for, you know, for the mini K 47, mini K 87. Um, the other issue is frequency curve. Uh, and so there can be bigger variation there. Uh, how much you'll hear that depends on your ears, right? Not everyone is George Massenberg. Um, some people will hear the difference and some people won't, just like some people when they're drinking wine can taste the sunny side of the hill, right? So there's individual differences in, in the way we perceive things. Um, if you wanted to record drum overheads with two you know, non-matched Mini K47s, go for it. I mean, they'll be pretty close. Uh, in fact, you may not hear the difference between them, uh, but the matched pair will be extraordinarily well matched. Um, we match over a wider frequency range than some companies that, um, uh, the charge, you know, $3,000 for a pair of mics. Um, so they'll be really well matched over a wider frequency range. And they also come in a, in a nicer case. Uh, the stereo pair case is, is like 20 or 30% bigger than a single mic case, but it still fits both mics, both shock mounts. And, uh, so it takes up less space and, um, the, uh, the foam liner is better too. We'll upgrade the other ones eventually once we sell out of this last production run, but the, the foam and the stereo pair case is nicer too. Um, you know, whenever we make something, we try to do it better than last time. Uh, foam is a great example. Um, so, uh, so that's the answer to that. Um, and so let's see. URL Tom says, hit the like button. That would actually be great. You know, I'm not good at uh, the, the social media thing, but if you guys could like and subscribe, that would probably help us quite a bit. Do you foresee any ribbons in Roswell's future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have one uh, that has been designed. It has not been manufactured. And uh, I don't have a timeline on it, unfortunately. I can't tell you that it's, you know, 30 days or 80 days or even 200 days. I don't know when it's going to come out. We do have one. I want to make one. Um, it's not ready. It's going to be great. Um, it's easy to say, I know, but it, it's going to be great. Uh, Seth Novak, ETA on match pair hypercardioid STC capsules. Uh, it's today, tomorrow. We have them. I didn't realize the website hadn't been up to date. I'm sorry about that. I'll make a note and make that uh, available again. Ribbon kit. Now we won't do a ribbon kit. Um, sorry, Carlton. So we had a ribbon kit. Um, you know, here's the thing. Ribbon mics aren't very complicated. Well, I mean, they are and they aren't. In a, in a microphone kit, um, you know, you've got uh, a circuit board. Not this one. This was a... Uh, uh, this was going to be uh, something else, but um, you know, you have a circuit board. Uh, yours would be in focus if you were to buy one. Ah, and then you you, you have to solder all those parts on, right? It's um, it's involved, and um, you know, there could be 20, 30, 40 parts that you have to put on there. And so there's this whole process where you have to do it. Uh, ribbon mics are basically for a passive ribbon, there's there's two components. There's the ribbon motor and there's the transformer. And so you end up soldering a couple of wires. So you might say, well, let's deconstruct it. You know, send me the ribbon and then the frame. But 
you can't, you know, because um, you, D, that's not appropriate for DIY. You can't tension a ribbon at home and expect to get professional results. Uh, I, I know people buy, um, you know, rack and pinion things. Uh, I think that's the right word, like a little corrugated zigzaggy piece of plastic and then a wheel you roll along it and you put the ribbon on there and you kind of do it. I saw one guy was doing it on a, on a camera, like the knurled knob around the camera. He was laying thin aluminum around there and pressing it down to get corrugations. Yeah, you can make that and it'll work, but it won't stand up to a thousand dollar ribbon. And I'm not really interested in making something that doesn't stand up to something that costs three or four times as much. Um, so our ribbon kit from years ago was very expensive. It was, um, the, the motors were all us production and, um, uh, transformers too. So very expensive stuff. Um, and then if you, uh, if you break it, you know, um, cause ribbons can be fragile. If you puff air at it and it's dead, well, that's, that's not covered by warranty. Right. So, I mean, it was kind of a high risk on the one hand, there wasn't a lot to building it. On the other hand, it was kind of high risk. Um, and this new one, we talked about doing a kit, but it would cost us as much to sell it as a kit as it would to just build the thing and sell it as a finished product with a warranty. So that's what it'll be finished product with a warranty. Uh, can EQ inside the mic circuit be close to quality sound wise with a voiced capsule that has nearly the same result? Um, I, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't think of it that way. I think of the mic circuit as getting out of the way of the capsule in most cases. The primary exception would be when you're trying to add color, which we do, like the Colaris and the T-series on the mic part side. The circuit is doing something kind of arguably borderline inappropriate, right? It's kind of adding harmonic saturation. Um, why? Because it sounds awesome. Uh, but in general, the mic's circuit is supposed to just get out of the way of the capsule. So the capsule transduces the signal, right? The, the audio waves flying through the air, turns them into a voltage and sends them out the bottom of the mic. Well, what's in between is the circuit, which is doing impedance matching and sometimes gain, but um, not impedance matching, but impedance reduction because the capsule is running at like gig ohm impedance. Um, so, uh, and then if you have a capsule that has a brighter voicing and you need to fix that, I'd rather do it in the circuit than in the DAW. So that's, you know, I, I don't think of mic circuits as like, let's add a bunch of 4K. Um, you know, whenever you're doing EQ in a circuit, I, I, actually, I guess I'm going to say no. Um, because EQ... You know, condenser mic capsules have distortion built in. Um, they just do. And it's not that you can hear it. It's part of the characteristic sound of the capsule. And it's true of, of all the capsules. And the reason is that there's, it's, the reason is based on something called stray capacitance. So I don't want to get into a physics lesson about it, but uh, basically there's this kind of inherent distortion in the capsule. And that's, that's one of the reasons why people who make ribbon mics say, Ribbon mics can be cleaner than condensers because the ribbon transducer doesn't have any distortion in it. And so when you EQ the ribbon, you're just EQing the audio signal. And I'm, I'm kind of speaking in, in blacks and whites, which is probably not appropriate because it's audio. And as we all know, it's not that black and white, but um, so if you're, if you're doing a bunch of EQ to the signal, especially if you're doing additive EQ in the circuit, I think, I think that wouldn't work as well as if the capsule just had the sound you were going for in the first place. That's my opinion. Um, uh, Mike asks, uh, custom K87, meaning high output, would the high output mini K87, which looks like this, uh, be as sensitive or more than the Colaris? Ah, yes. Um, yeah, you, you or someone had asked to compare the sensitivity of the Colaris to the minis, and I don't honestly know. My guess is that the Delphos is higher than the minis and that the Colaris is also higher than the minis. Um, let me think what I was just working on. Yeah, my guess is that the Colaris is uh, probably uh, at least four to six dB higher than the Mini K87, which means that the custom Mini K87 would probably be similar to the Colaris, I think. I, I haven't compared them, but I'm guessing that that would be the case. Um, David asks about the Platinum Edition mic parts compared to the non-Platinum. Um, okay, so... Um, 
Thanks for sticking around, everybody. So uh, probably just take a couple of more after this. How are we doing? Ah, Zar join. Good to see you, Chris. Transformer, Lucifer versus Transformer. I'll get into that. Thank you for asking. Okay, so um, Platinum. I think it was David asked about Platinum Edition. So so here's the thing. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, so Mike Parts is this kind of DIY company where we can make one of something, and that's cool because uh, – you can experiment. We, we can experiment with Mike Part stuff. We don't have to make packaging and all of, we don't have to have dealers and price sheets and all that, right? We, we can make one of something and see how it goes. Uh, Roswell was kind of set up to take some of those ideas and make them into products that we can make in higher volume. So there's fewer products, right? Roswell has five mics. Mike Parts has 12 or more. I don't even know. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, I really like designing new things. Um, do I have? Uh, it's not in reach. I have something really cool <laughs> that I probably shouldn't show off anyway um, that I was working on over the weekend. But uh, I really enjoy taking these ideas and, you know, different capsules, different voicings. Um, I, I have an associate. Uh, we trade thousand word emails about capacitors and diodes and resistors. And um, I really enjoy that stuff. And I really enjoy uh, this idea that certain components can do subtle, can, can have subtle effects on the sound of the mic. And again, you know, it's like I mentioned about uh, um, uh, earlier, you know, not everyone can hear all these things, um, but some people can. And that's, it's for those people that the platinum edition mic parts mics were made for. Um, so I, I really enjoy designing new things and, and making these new combinations, these variations on products. Um, some of them can't be done in any kind of production sense. Um, take as an example, the mythical famed uh, loved black gate capacitor. I don't know if anyone knows what those are, remembers what those are. Um, Just close the session. Okay. I don't know. Anyway, uh, black gate capacitors, right? So these went out of production, I don't know, 2008 or nine, a while back. They were made by Rubicon. Uh, it's an electrolytic capacitor. Uh, so it's a little can with two legs coming out the bottom, but they are uh, very highly uh, regarded for audio applications because they sound better in a lot of applications, whether it's DC filtering or coupling or anything else. And, um, why are they so special? Well, people would say because they had graphite paper as, as one of the components inside. Uh, it's an organic material. Um, it's it's paper that's been somehow impregnated with graphite. The machine that made that uh, has been decommissioned. And um, the company Rubicon uh, makes, I don't know, 20 million capacitors a month. I don't know if that's right. It's a huge, like unbelievable number. And it's not just for audio. They make capacitors for everybody, automotive and aerospace and all kinds of things. Um and so when people like myself and my associate I mentioned earlier talk about capacitors and, and get nerdy about the sounds of these components, when we say, you know, we could sell a ton of black gate capacitors and they're like, okay, we're, we're at 20 million. Yeah. <laughs> How many more can you, you know, none. So, um, so black gate capacitors, look on eBay, 60, 70 bucks a piece, you know, if you can find them. Um, so the platinum series, uh, tries to embrace some of these rare, hard to find parts that are kind of esoteric, but have an interesting effect on the sound. And we can't get them in enough quantity to, uh, to put them into production. Um, so we won't have any DIY kits. We're not gonna make manuals and all that kind of stuff. Um, most of the platinum products actually have different circuit boards because the parts that we decided to use don't fit the old ones, you know, um, like some of the, some of these old resistors that we like to use, um, the leads are fatter than the Dale resistors that we normally use. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with Dale resistors. Uh, we like them quite a bit. Uh, but some of these older resistors have, uh, thicker wires that don't go through the circuit board. So it's, you know, we need to make a new circuit board to fit all these new components. So, so the platinum series is basically, uh, you know, the best of what we can find, um, sometimes they incorporate circuit changes, just stuff that we've come up with since the other products went into production. Are they better? I don't know. I mean, you'd have to tell me if you like it better. That's really all that matters. 
Um, and they're not better for people who have a budget because they they cost more. I mean, you know, these are one-off hand-built mics and they're limited by their nature because uh, we can't get the parts. Um, so that's what the Platinum Series is. Um, and then Chris Czar asked about uh, difference in characteristics between transformerless mics and transformer coupled mics. So that's a really good question. Um, I like that question a lot. Um, and uh, here's my take on it. And I tell you this not as, I'm not saying this is always true of every uh, microphone you ever come across or preamp or anything else. Okay. So big disclaimer, um, transformerless microphones tend to be lower distortion. They tend to have more accurate transient response. Um, is that good or bad? Depends, right? What do you want? So uh, let's talk about transformers for a minute. Uh, transformers are often used in the output of a microphone circuit in order to lower the impedance of the signal to something that's appropriate for your downstream preamp, right? So a typical mic output impedance is anywhere between 50 and about 200 ohms. Um, whereas the mic circuit itself is typically running at much higher impedance. So you need to lower that down to get it out uh, down the wire. Um, but the way transformers work is it's, uh, and you know, Peterson from DIY RE has a really great video on how transformers work. It's like explained to me, like I'm five, how transformers work. And it's this cool animation. So I would suggest everyone go check that out if you're interested, but, uh, you put a signal in one end and then through this kind of weird magnetic coupling effect, uh, through one coil of wire, the sound magically jumps over to this other coil of wire that isn't actually touching it. Um, and so what can happen is that the, the core of the transformer can have a, I'm kind of bastardizing this, but can have kind of a, a memory effect. Like you can have, um, it's not terribly uncommon uh, that the signal you put in is not exactly the same as the signal you get back out. Now, sometimes that change is, is good. It sounds good. Sometimes it's, it's used for effect and it sounds great. But the point is, in some cases, it's not the same, which gets back to what I said earlier, that transformerless microphones tend to have a more accurate transient response. Why? Well, because they don't have a transformer that's sitting in there kind of screwing everything up. Now, again, I'm not dumping on transformers. I love them in certain cases, but that's that's the effect that they can have, right? The effect that a transformer can have is that it can muck up the sound in a way that your transient response isn't quite all there. Sometimes that's awesome. Uh, one of the time I, I once put up a pair of, um, two pairs of Mike Parts STCs. Mike Parts has a transformerless STC based on the old Sheps model and a transformer coupled L uh, STC based on the KM84. And I used the same capsules on both. Um, and I measured, uh, they, they sounded very much the same except the snare drum transients through the transformer coupled mic were six or eight or 10 dB lower. So um, now these tests were made at different times wasn't the same performance because I wanted to use the same capsules in the same position, right? So I'd actually put up one pair, recorded 30 seconds, took the mics down, took off the capsules, put the capsules on the second pair of mics, put the mics up in the same position and record it again. So, um, you know, maybe to some degree I was hitting the snare a little less hard the second pass. You know, I, I, I don't know if I was or not. I have no way to prove that. Um, but what I, what I saw was that the levels were the same, you know, uh, they were, the levels were within half a dB or a dB. And then I was, I, I game matched them even beyond that. But even then the snare drum transients were lower. Why? Well, part of it was because the microphone was compressing the transients a little bit. Now, um, two interesting things about that. One is that track would be easier to mix because the snare drums weren't poking out, the snare drum hits weren't poking out so high. Two is, I took the transformerless track and I applied compression to it to get those transients down by ATB and I could hear it, meaning I could hear the compression artifacts. Whereas on the transformer coupled mic, it didn't sound squished or compressed in any way. It was really natural. It was a really natural sounding track. So um, that's one of the differences. Um, now, a lot of people ascribe harmonic saturation to transformers. Like if you want a mic that has that kind of coloration, that warmth or whatever has to have a transformer. I would say not so much. Um, it, it can, it certainly can, depending on how the transformer is being used in the circuit. 
but that's not a given. So if you if you have two mics, one is a transformer, you couldn't honestly automatically say the one with the transformer is going to have saturation. It may or may not. Uh, it it kind of depends on everything else in the circuit. Depends on how that was set up. Um, hey, Matt Fox joined. Good to see you, sir. Um, good. I think that's it, right? We're at an hour and seven. Uh, yeah, an hour and seven minutes. So that's it for now. Um, I would appreciate comments. If you guys have feedback, good or bad, I'd love to do another one of these. Um, send in your questions. Um, leave comments on the video. If you have questions there, that would be great too. Um, that's everything I wanted to cover. I just want to say thank you for joining and um, I will see you next time.